Um, when we speak about NUHS, it is actually a whole system, right? National University Health System. So it comprises the hospitals, the polyclinics. There is one community hospital outside of the acute care, the one in Jurong, as well as a whole lot of schools. So here we're speaking about the School of Medicine, Dentistry, Public Health. And within the School of Medicine, there's also the School of Nursing and Pharmacy. But we soon realized that we're only as strong as our weakest link. Once we talk about this whole system, uh, we want to make sure that all our staff are well and our students as well, because um, those coming out to schools would then feed into the work um, setting. And if they're not resilient, they're not compassionate with themselves, um, there's going to be problems because working life, as we all know, is demanding. And especially in healthcare, we need not only compassion for our patients, but for ourselves. So the effort to strive and make sure this entire ecosystem without leaving anyone out was a bit of a challenge. And this was also in line um, with what we call our tricep values. Each um, cluster or group, health group, together with Sing Health and NHG, we have our values. So the ones at N NUHS are simply uh, teamwork, respect, integrity. The C is for compassion, obviously. E is for excellence, and then P for patient-centered care. And if we distill that into seeing how mindfulness comes across, it would be three things. The first being the present-mindedness, the full concentration and focus that we bring to our work. The compassion, not only for our patients, but when we care for ourselves, for our colleagues. And also that resilience, that without which uh, we would not be able to do our day-to-day -day work. So the program types that over the years we've come uh, up with, or I've come up with, with the help of the participants, one was called the Mind-Body Medicine for Clinicians. Another was yoga and mindfulness. This was after work hours, and um, people would at the same time stretch their bodies as well as um, let their minds sort of be, be at ease. Mindfulness for nurses, which was a special one because um, our emergency department nurses as well as ICU nurses, there was a need, so that was created. Mindfulness for medical students that included the self-compassion modules as well. And um, towards the end of um, last year, there was a request for postdoctoral students and fellows because of the pandemic, or at least um, due, due to certain um, effects of it, a lot were facing difficulty in doing the research work maintaining certain grants, and also getting jobs once their research was over, especially for the PhD students. So there was a lot of stress and a lot of worry and anxiety. So there was a need there, and therefore I worked with them. Um, the challenges, I'm sure you would all identify with it. Finding time in a busy day, right? Um, whether it's an acute hospital, the polyclinics, or the schools, everyone is rushing around, and the pace of which we do that this often does not allow for time. So creating that time, uh, using protected time for teaching as well was a little bit of uh, a battle. Perception. If you're strong, you don't need mindfulness, right? So people think, why bother? Work is work. Of course, it's tough. Nobody ever promised that it's going to be easy. So why do we need, you know, if you engage and you studied and you come into this profession, this is what you get. So there's no need for mindfulness. The modality, as time went on, we used Zoom rather than face-to-face. -face, and I felt it and some of my colleagues felt that it was a lot more difficult. Um, those who remained um, anonymous because they didn't put their cameras on, did say that they found Zoom to be more comfortable because they wanted to attend without, you know, um, disclosing who they were. So that too probably was one of the upsides. But in general, most preferred face-to-face. -face. 
And also the perception that mindfulness is fluff, right? It's not um, serious. It's not science-based. There's very little evidence for it, according to them. So um, this is the example of one of the programs that I ran. So it's a summary. It is called the Mind Body Medicine. This was um, tested out on what we call PGY1s. It's an acronym for postgraduate year one. So the house officers, they've got their MBBS and they're doing their first year uh, in clinical practice um, in rotating in hospitals every four months. And there's a very steep learning curve. And therefore we thought this would be appropriate for them. The program looks a bit like this. So we tell them, or I tell them, their participation has to be full commitment, attention, intention, accountability, and action as well. And we go on to simply say that coping is good, but thriving at work is what we want to aim for, that joy, that meaning and purpose that they bring to their work, because that will sustain them. The techniques and tools are the ones that are pretty common uh, in the work of mindfulness and self-compassion. So there would be breath work, guided imagery, gratitude practice, body scan, sitting or standing yoga, depending. Um, some would be in the wards and standing, and therefore it wouldn't be um, so convenient to do the sitting yoga. Appreciative inquiry, where it's almost close to reflection in a way where they go through um, what they feel, the emotions and everything from the practice. Um, the use of the PERMA model by uh, Professor Seligman, all about uh, positive um, emotions and care. So that, that part of it, um, we used certain things um, also to raise the engagement, relationships, meaning and accomplishment. So it was in four parts, um, the mind-body medicine um, module. Uh, after the introduction, we would go through pain and suffering. So the tagline in this was, pain is inevitable. However, suffering is optional. So based on that one uh, claim or sentence, we would discuss, I would go through videos, and we would talk about how we can overcome that. Um, a central pillar to that was the work done by Viktor Frankl because um, we, we thought that the man's search for meaning, his seminal work, was something that would be relevant to this choice of pain and suffering. Um, then the second um, session would be on the beginner's mind again, um, our prejudices, our assumptions, and things that we come uh, into a situation with that we could sometimes improve by erasing that slate and cleaning everything. So that second um, session in the module was all about beginner's mind. The third was something that they face um, more and more as they come into their um, their work situations that they didn't face so much as students, although they did have clinical attachments, all about dying and death. And one um, particular video that is of a substantial length I chose to use, it is from the New York Times, and it was released last year, I think, either in September or October, um, so 2020. And the title of that is dying in my mother's arms. If you Google it, you will find it um, either YouTube or the New York Times videos. And because it's lo fairly long, uh, about 18 to 20 minutes, um, they could watch it beforehand and then come to class and, and discuss it. It was very poignant um, based on the work of one of the palliative care um, pediatrics, uh, pediatricians in New York and her work accompanying uh, parents with children that are not going to make it. And um, she also visits them at home when they're not in the hospital setting. So that gave us a very rich um, support for um, this particular theme. And finally, the fourth session of this Mind Body Medicine um, module was a wrap up where we go through the uh, tenets of mindfulness and um, we sort of assessed where they were in their journey and they didn't have to have all of them in one go. It would be difficult to also practice all of them um, immediately. What we did say 
was um, in, in their busy lives, they could have an option of two ways of being able to at least sustain or practice it. Either through dedicated practice, that means they set aside time, whether it's half an hour twice a week or an hour, or um, they, it's, it's set time and programmed into their schedules. If it's not dedicated practice, then they could do integrated practice. That means a few minutes here, a few minutes there, whenever they're able to um, find that time, could be waiting at the bus stop, in the MRT, um, in, whilst they drive at the traffic light, if they're you know, just going to do some breathing. So that integrated practice um, or at work between patients was also another way of uh, sustaining this practice. So um, to, to briefly show you some photographs, I didn't show the ones with our um, PGY ones or our clinicians, but the nurses were quite happy. So I got their permission. Um, we also, um, being a new space, had a lot of um, rooms that we could use for this. So um, that is a, it's a huge plus when we need to do this in a quiet, comfortable and safe setting. Um, also, the entire gym at the top floor of Tower Block, this was with uh, all the staff. Um, so they were able to do some body work and some mind work. And um, I, I was quite pleased that the entire floor was actually covered with uh, beautiful mats and people on it doing um, just what they were intended to do. Tips um, for success, I would say, would be to start small, although we have bigger ambitions. Everything has to start somewhere. So um, don't worry too much if it's not perfect. Just start and start small. Identify a few champions amongst your participants and the people that you need buy-in from. There'll be a few that can actually help you and run with it. So identify them early and um, sort of support one another to pull this through. Make friends with HR because when you want time off work for people to participate in all this, um, it's, it's actually quite a good um, way to get around it, to get that time and to get permission for them to be off work for this. Um, make friends also with the facilities management because you're going to be able to find rooms um, if they're not all already booked and sometimes they're just block booked but actually no one's using it. So uh, making friends is very useful because you need um, that space. Collect feedback from your participants often and make sure you act on it because then you can eliminate what doesn't work and what could work better and what they're actually happy with that you should continue. Um, don't be preachy because when I um, speak of mindfulness, I make sure that um, I do not sound like a broken record, first of all, talking about it all the time. And whoever wants to come, comes. And whoever wants to leave, can leave. There's no um, strict protocol. Only thing is, if they are committed, they, they must come in. And otherwise, it's fine if they don't. Um, and... The last thing I would say, and this has helped me, is to spend time regularly with young children. You can either observe them in a playground or if you've got uh, no longer got young children, maybe nephews and nieces or even grandchildren, you will find that a lot of our practice is actually, you know, when the children see things with a beginner's mind, when they are non-striving and they're actually pretty accepting of other people and they're not um, full of um, sort of baggage that we grown-ups have and uh, expectations. So um, children I find very refreshing and having spent time with them, I am actually a better facilitator when it comes to mindfulness. Um, I wish you serenity and peace in all your undertakings and I thank you for your time uh, and dedicating your Saturday afternoon with us.